Hi, in today's episode we finally get the color video running. This is the fourth part of the series developing a game console on the ESP32. If you are here to learn about the PAL color encoding, I have the theory explained here. But it might also be interesting for you to see how a cheap microcontroller can be hacked to be able to generate such signals. If you haven't watched it yet, you might also check out the first episode explaining the timings of composite video. Let's dive into the theory how the color encoding works. This video will cover PAL which stands for Phase Alternating Line. NTSC is the predecessor of PAL and works quite similar. The PAL color carrier signal has the frequency of 4.4 MHz and provides an improved color stability since it has a hue correction implemented. The color information is modulated onto the luminance signal we are already familiar with from the first episode. To indicate that we have a color signal in place, there is a burst signal in the invisible blinking phase of the line. This burst is used to synchronize the oscillator of the decoder to the correct phase of the color. It simply then cycles of the carrier frequency of the color signal with an amplitude of 150 mV and shifted by plus minus 135 degree, but more on that later. The color of each pixel is now encoded by this oscillation modulated on top of the luminance using quadrature amplitude modulation. That sounds complicated and the explanations all around the web are a bit intimidating. But the website I also used for the first part nailed it with this simple formula. Let me explain this shortly. The signal uses the YUV color space. The more common RGB can be converted to YUV easily. The luminance which we have used so far as simple gray values is represented by the Y. Y contains all color components from RGB weighted by the absolute brightness. So U and V are simply the complements which can be used to calculate back to RGB. But caution, unlike RGB components, the UV components can also be negative. U and V are now modulated onto Y where U is the horizontal and V is the vertical axis in this color space. So far so good, but wait, there is more. PAL provides a feature that is able to correct the hue of the color from phase shift errors in the carrier signal. The hue is represented by the phase and the saturation by the amplitude. In this color space, the phase can be shown as the angle of the vector and the amplitude by the length. When a phase shift error occurs, it will rotate the vector in one direction. To compensate this, PAL negates the V component on alternating lines. When the decoder negates it back, the rotation is reversed and the average of the two vectors corrects the hue. It creates a small saturation error, but that's a little trade-off for the correct hue. This is a major improvement over NTSC, but it also reduces the vertical color resolution. The sine of V is reflected by the sine of the phase shift of the burst signal. Plus 135 degree for positive V and minus 135 for negative. You could also skip the correction. Simply use 135 degree every line not negating V, but this would be out of spec. Ok, that was a lot of information dumped on you. You can play around with this demonstrator tool yourself and get familiar with the mechanics on the project page linked below. Now back to the specific implementation for the ESP32. Ok, I might have stated in the first episode that color wouldn't be possible at our sampling rate. I thought it wouldn't be reliable enough since we have around 3 samples to represent a complete sine wave and our ducks are a bit lazy and can't change the values instantly from pixel to pixel. This is indeed the case, but the color correction does its job and I'm surprised how good it works anyways. I tested it on an analog TV, on the TFT and also on the frame grabber. There seem to be some problems occasionally, but this is really not reproducible. Looking closer at sharp edges, you can see the color fringing that's caused by the duck that can't follow the signal fast enough. Still, the color looks awesome and creates some kind of retro feeling. On the hardware side, we still don't need any extra components to get this running. Indeed, nothing except for uploading the code and connecting pin 25 and ground to composite video is needed. You need also to connect pin 26 if you want the audio. The Arduino projects can also be found on the project page. If you have worked with previous versions of the code, there are a few changes to incorporate the color. I got some hints from you that old game consoles have used non-interlaced PAL. This is not specified in the standards, but seems to work with less flickering. I have connected the Super Nintendo to my scope and checked the timings and syncs it is using. 
I was really surprised to see the timing so simplified and that there is only one field and no annoying shift by half a row. I have copied the simplified timings which reduce the amount of code used for the output. The frame buffer format is now YUV to be able to display the image fast enough. Since there is not enough memory for a bigger frame buffer, each pixel is still 8-bit wide. The luminance is stored in the 4 least significant bits and U or V are stored in the 4 most significant bits alternating each line. I picked this arrangement since the color components are shared between two lines anyway. There are helper functions to set RGB colors and there is a new sprite converter that stores 16-bit RGBA sprites. I also tried to generate NTSC color but wasn't able to get it running so far. Probably the carrier misaligns badly with our sampling rate. Nevertheless, the most TFT TVs should be able to display PAL signals. I guess this is good enough for this project since we are able to implement cool games on the ESP32 with little effort now. Join me in the upcoming livestream where we can develop a simple space shooter. If you like this project please share it, it really helps growing this channel. Don't forget to subscribe and see you next time, bye!